Welcome to Financial Insider Weekly. I'm your host, Michael Gray, CPA. My guest today is Bill Mahan, William Mahan, attorney at law. Uh, Bill has a law office in San Jose, California. He is of counsel to Gates Eisenhart Dawson. He's been practicing law for, what, about 35 years or so? 35 years. Unbelievable. Just He started when he was two. <laughs> anyway, uh, he has a master's in taxation uh, from Gold Gate University, and he also uh, has a JD degree from Santa Clara University. Bill's practice focuses on estate planning, probate, and business planning. Uh, Bill, so thanks for joining me today. My pleasure. Okay. Uh, so today, Bill and I are going to be talking about what might seem like a basic topic, but it's a neglected topic, neglected topic, and that is why you need a will. And as we get into this, um, this is just uh, a, sort of an introduction, uh, sort of the beginning of what should be a conversation with your own attorney. And uh, Bill and I are both in California. He's a California attorney. I'm a California CPA. So there may be some differences uh, that can apply uh, from state to state, and so just be aware of that. And who knows, maybe even some people, maybe somebody from Australia is watching this, so <laughs> they'll have differences too. Oh, they have wells there too. And yes, they do. <laughs> okay, well, Bill, any guess about what percentage of the adult population doesn't have a will? Uh, yeah, it's most people don't. Most adults who uh, could benefit from estate planning, whether it's a will or a trust, don't I? Uh, the last number I saw indicated about maybe a third of the people who could or should have a will actually have them. Right, and the ones who don't have them probably they're out of date, right? So well, that depends. <laughs> sometimes sometimes they last a very long time. Yeah. Sometimes they're outdated in a month because something changed. You know, yeah. so you have to keep them up for sure. That you yeah. So why do you think people don't get a will? I mean, we're talking about you think maybe two thirds of the population doesn't have one. Yeah, I think it's just, uh, a lot of it's just procrastination. A lot of it is just not feeling that it's an urgent thing. Uh, if you're not, I think, if you don't think you're going to be dying soon, you know, it's something you can put off. And, you know, the, the pressures of daily life or other things to think about. And so people just kind of put it off. And I think another thing is that people kind of have negative feelings about estate planning and, you know, it makes them think of morbid things uh, like their own mortality and the, it, it, so it's not a happy kind of a project for most people. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition to that, what I find is sometimes it actually is sort of a thorny issue for people because it, it might raise issues um, with people that they love and live with uh, <clears throat> that they don't necessarily want to address head on. So, so sometimes there's something like that. Yeah, well, I'm hearing something like, I think close to half of our population that are in relationships are living together. They're not even married. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I so. mean, it, that's, I don't know the percentages, but a very high percentage of us, particularly people 30 and under, um, they don't marry like they did. And certainly the percentages are way down. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't make it any less important for people to do estate planning, though, because a lot of those people, if they live together, uh, own property together, uh, and, you know, they have certainly desires about what they want to do with their property. Mm -hmm. They might even have children together, and um, right. you know, so the, the needs are still there, whether they're actually married or not. They actually probably have very special problems that they yeah. need to think about. Bigger problems, really. What are some things that you think eventually? Or, I mean, you you prepare wills and trusts and so forth. So, what do you see eventually seems to motivate people to go ahead? Uh, usually, it's something something significant that happens, um, and so it's. Uh, the big things in life, you, you uh, get married, mm -hmm. uh, you have a child. Children are a big reason people do estate planning because they realize that young children can't really do, you know, take care of themselves and they need someone to take care of them. And so that raises the question, if something happens to me, who's going to take care of my child? Mm -hmm. And that, um, that involves things like guardian nominations and all of that brings it to mind estate planning. You know, so, so that will do it. Uh, sometimes somebody that you know uh, or in your family dies and you see the process or you get involved in the process and it, it motivates people then to do their own estate planning because sometimes 
if, if it hasn't been done in the other person's estate, it really creates some long-term and expensive problems to resolve everything. Right. So, so they could say, gosh, uh, maybe I better get one of these things. <laughs> yeah, it, it motivates quite a few people to do estate planning. When, or the other thing is I have, like, I have clients right now who are leaving on a trip uh, Monday. Right. And this Monday they got motivated <laughs> <laughs> because they, they were going to climb on board a jet, you know, so that kind of thing. Yeah. So, um, well, you never know, especially if you go traveling to more remote places or, you know, like volunteers, for example, that to go to help out in these countries in Africa and so right. on. And, well, even know. just climbing onto a jet airplane to yeah. get together yeah. makes people think about it. So yeah. Okay. These are the things I hear when people come to see me. <laughs> well, that's good. Well, what are some of the things that happens if you don't have a will? Uh, well, everybody, if you have an estate, if you have no estate, you know. No big deal. <laughs> I mean, certain things are going to happen. You know, people have credit cards and things like that. They need to be resolved. But um, an estate is really about more than just who's going to get your property. It is also about, you know, wh who did you owe money to and how do you clear title to property if you had title, uh, your name on any t kind of title. So all of that has to be cleared up. And the way it's done is um, if you have no will, then either uh, you have, if you're fortunate enough to have your property titled in such a way that it will pass to somebody else without the need of any kind of formal proceeding like a probate, then it would pass you know, through that methodology, through maybe a beneficiary designation or something. Mm -hmm. But other than that, uh, what's required is some kind of probate proceeding. Mm -hmm. And so the probate code takes over if you haven't specified uh, anything in writing. Uh, you are said to have died in testate, meaning you have no testamentary documents. And then the probate code determines um, what happens next. So somebody's going to petition the superior court to be appointed your administrator. Uh, and they would then manage your estate and notify the creditors and the whole process of probate occurs. Mm -hmm. Uh, it takes about a year for most probates to be processed, which is a long time. It <clears throat> requires some court uh, appearances. It's expensive because probate fees are based on a percentage of the gross value of the estate. Mm -hmm. By that, what I mean is if you have a house that has a large mortgage, you don't subtract the mortgage from the value of the house that's going through probate. This is the gross right. value. So it's expensive. It's time-consuming. It's a public procedure. People uh, are aware of what you owned and, and who, you <coughs> who you left it to. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, yeah, it, it's a way of processing an estate and taking care of all the details, but it's it's lengthy and inexpensive and and um, public. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, well, in a way, we're sort of getting into what are some of the advantages of a trust. Right, uh, right, right. Thinking. Because the same thing does happen with if you have a will. It's just the difference is um, without a will you haven't said anything about who's going to take over your estate, who's going to manage your estate. Um, you, haven't, you haven't said anything about how you want your estate to be distributed. So the probate code is going to control all of that. With a will, you still have probate procedures to go through and the issues of the time and the, uh, and the fact that it's a public matter. But you've controlled at least who's in charge of it and you can have your say about who your property goes to. Right. So... Uh, so one of the things uh, then is, again, so you haven't named uh, who, for example, your executor is going to be. And so there's got to be a process for figuring that out. That's going to create a you know, little con convenience and delay, I guess. Well, actually, even getting, whether you have a will or not, getting into probate court takes time because mm -hmm. you have to get on the calendar and the mm -hmm. calendar depending on what county that you're living in, uh, is, you know, as, uh, as much as a couple of months before you can get on the calendar. The people that would petition the court, um, it's not just anybody who would petition to probate your estate, but it, it's usually somebody who has an interest in your estate, and there's a priority by which, you know, the mm -hmm. probate court would choose who's your, who your, ex your administrator is. <clears throat> but whoever petitions the court and says, appoint me, they're the one asking, and unless somebody objects to their appointment, they're probably going to get appointed. It could even be one of the parties that could be interested in your estate as one of your creditors. They can even petition to probate your estate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 
the advantages to having some control over that by at least doing a well are significant. Right. Now another thing is, again, you were talking about who gets your property. So what happens related to that if there's no will? Well, you know, everybody, pretty much everybody has heirs. Uh -huh. And um, the probate code, again, specifies who your heirs are. So it depends on the kind of property that you own. And by that I mean, is it all your separate property? Is it partly separate, partly community? Is it all community property? Community property exists uh, with people who are married or with uh, registered domestic partners also in California. So uh, who gets it and the percentage of, of your estate they might get depends on the kind of property that it is and your relationships with other people. So if you have just parents, your parents are your heirs. If you have, um, if they're not there, it would be your brothers and sisters and people like that. If you're married and have children, then your spouse and your children are your heirs and they're the people who would, it's, it really sort of makes sense in terms of who would get your property, okay. but you're, you're not choosing how it goes. It's right. being done by the probate right. code. So in a sense, a will has been written for you in a way Right. which is the intestacy, intestacy rules. And so they do designate who will get the property, but it may not be who you would have chosen yourself. Right. Well, there are also other significant problems, even if it's the people you would have chosen, like let's mm -hmm. say your children. Yeah. Uh, minor children cannot inherit property directly. Uh -huh. And so by not having something written down, they would still be your heirs, but there would have to be some kind of court guardianship set up, and then it would have to be managed that way until they were uh, adults, which is 18 in California. Mm -hmm. And at that point, they could, they could actually receive your property. But that, you know, with, that's one of the reasons why when you have children, it's really important to start writing things down, because you can actually provide for all of that without having to have a court-appointed guardian. You can do things like write a trust into your will and name a trustee, and now you're in control of who's managing it. They manage it for the benefit of the children, pay for their education and such, and they don't have to give it. It doesn't have to be given to them when they're 18. It can be later, you know, because it's a trust, you can designate how old they are. Yeah. So are there some other things to think about related to small children? or What are some... So one one of the things that you're saying is if you have small children, it's a good idea to set up a trust in your will or to have some sort of a trust document. Well, yeah, the other thing that you should definitely do is nominate a guardian for your yeah. small children mm -hmm. um, because, uh, again, <clears throat> as, as minor children, they're going to need to have somebody act as their guardian for certain decisions that have to be made, uh, uh, whether they have to do with their health decisions or their property decisions. And so the, as a parent, you would want to be able to control or at least try to control who actually had the custody and, you know, control of your children. Um, without the nomination, again, the, the probate code has a priority based on relationship to the children. And again, who, uh, you know, asked the court, the court to appoint them. But what happens if the uh, parents nominate somebody is that person goes to the top of the list. Mm -hmm. So whoever's nominated goes to the top of the list as the most likely choice. And so at that point, it doesn't have to be the person, the relative who would be first or even somebody in the family necessarily. It's important to note though that this is a nomination however you do it. And by nomination, that means that it's not definite. The court still has to determine what's in the best interest of the child whether before they would appoint anybody. Now. Um Okay. Oh, can a different person manage the assets and be the guardian? Um, yeah, if you, if you write it down, mm -hmm. well, obviously it could be even if the court appoints them, you just don't know who those people are going to be. But if you write down who you want to act as guardian because you think it would be the most appropriate household, the most appropriate environment, the people that the child gets along with the best, uh, that would be your first choice for guardian. Your first choice for managing their uh, financial assets would probably be uh, the person that you think is the best at doing that job. Mm -hmm. So you can name different people to uh, manage assets and other, other family members or other people to be the guardian for the child, which is actually a pretty good idea because then you have more than one person overseeing things and there's sort of uh, you know, checks and balances. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any thoughts about adult children, and particularly children from a previous marriage? 
uh, well, again, um, there's all kinds of issues with, with that kind of children from a previous. I, I sort of opened up the one day seminar here. So. <laughs> yeah. It's a very, very common situation as well. So um, the, the first problem with that is if you don't do any kind of written estate plan, and you die, then your property is going to be divided up depending again on the kind of property that is separate or community. Mm -hmm. um, and with children from a prior marriage, if you want something to go to your children from a prior marriage, um, and if the property you own with your spouse has been created or transmuted into community property, um, then if you did an estate plan, you could actually leave part of your half of the community to those children from a prior marriage. If you don't have an estate plan, it's going to go to your spouse, and then you are depending upon your spouse to take care of your children from a prior marriage. So oftentimes you have her children, his children, maybe our children, mm -hmm. and they're not necessarily all going to be treated in the same way if one spouse dies first and then the survivor decides what happens next. So it can sort of be a matter of just chance as to which family gets everything or nothing uh, according to the, to the laws of intestacy. Whereas if you do estate planning, you can set aside a portion of the estate, even if it's for the benefit of your surviving spouse, while well, he or she remains alive, but at the second death goes to your children from a prior marriage or whoever you want it to go to. So you have more control and more protection for your family if you do some kind of estate planning. It would, it would require including some kind of a trust, but you know, that kind of flexibility is uh, possible with estate planning. Okay. Do you have maybe some thoughts you'd like to share related to second marriage in general? Well, are, are we speaking of prenuptial agreements? Well, that's one thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you know, my experience is that usually people that are getting married for the first time, unless it's a celebrity or somebody that's really wealthy and the family's sort of insisting on it, you don't hear much about prenuptial agreements. People who are getting married uh, for the second or third time, is some, it's something that's much more common because people have experienced uh, in the first dissolution of marriage mm -hmm. uh, situation what happens mm -hmm. and how property gets divided and how um, you know, difficult that might be. And so they are more likely to engage in um, an agreement mm -hmm. that specifies what is separate property, what is community property, and maybe sometimes how things are going to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. Um, in the event of divorce, but also in the event of death. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Do, um, when you have a second marriage situation, do you think it's a good idea for each spouse to have their own attorney when they're having an estate plan done? Well, that, you know, that depends. Um, it certainly is a, is, it's a requirement if you're going to do a prenuptial agreement, really. The law requires, in order for it to be the most effective, that you have separate attorneys. Mm -hmm. For um, husbands and wives who are doing estate planning, there is a potential conflict of interest anytime you, uh, one lawyer tries to represent two people regardless of the, the prior marriages. Mm -hmm. if, they, if they don't really agree on what they want to do, then the conflict becomes a real conflict. And that, at that point, it's, it's pretty much impossible to do an estate mm -hmm. plan for both people as one attorney. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly each if people are married um, or a couple, they have the right to have their own attorney. They have the right to have their own estate plan. They don't have to do, they're not required to do estate planning together. Mm -hmm. uh, and so sometimes people don't do that. But if people can agree about what they want to do uh, and they waive any conflict that there might be with the one attorney representing them, that's really the most common way estate planning is done. Okay. Where should you keep a will? Well, there's controversy about that as well <laughs> because part of it is part of it is because of marketing, in my opinion. But uh -huh. uh, a lot of uh, people, uh, attorneys even, who prepare estate plans, they want to put them in nice binders and you know things that look really nice. Uh, but those types of um, documents are very difficult to store, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So what do you do with this big binder that has your estate plan in it? Mm -hmm. you, unless you have a really big safe or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people put it in the desk drawer, put it on the bookshelf or whatever, and uh, it, that's not the, certainly not the safest place for it, in t both in terms of what might happen to it if the house burns down, but also just in terms of other people, you know, maybe getting their hands on it and, and 
it's no longer really that private. So I, I, don't, I don't think that's the best place. I think the best place is a, a safe deposit box at a bank. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I don't, for that reason, I don't put my estate planning documents into binders. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason that's the safest place is because uh, you, you're the person who has access to that. You can add people if you want to to have access. But the other thing is if the, if the bank burns down, the vault isn't going to burn down and your documents aren't going to be lost. So I've had clients lose their documents when their house burned down and that's a very difficult problem. Yeah. What about the situation where there are some attorneys that actually keep the wills. Uh, yeah, that's that's a, another fairly common practice. And there's some benefit to it in that you, again, it's presumably kept in a safe place. I don't do that. I never have done that uh, because, uh, first of all, I don't know where I'm going to be in 10 or 20 years. Uh -huh. So the clients, I get inquiries from people all the time saying, did you yeah. possibly do estate planning for my parents or my uh -huh. grandparents? Uh -huh. because they're looking for the documents, uh -huh. uh, you know, and I don't know where the clients are going to be. They may have moved to a different state or a different country. Um, and so I prefer to keep a copy of everything and make sure the clients have the original documents and that they understand they should be someplace like a safe deposit box so they are available if something happens. Um, and then if, they're, if I'm not around or they move away, then they're not looking for me. I'm not looking for them. Yeah. So I, uh, I think you know I'm like an associate member of um, Silicon Valley Bar Association, and they you get emails from time to time from the attorneys. You know, has anybody seen the will for such and such? A yeah, person? yeah, they send out blanket <laughs> blanket mailings to try to locate something. And and I have had the situation where um, I've had a client pass away, and the attorney was gone, and. <clears throat> And they basically they were having real difficulty finding wills and trusts. Right. And now I happen to have some copies of some documents. In this particular case, I'm not sure what they did after I gave them to them. So yeah, so, well, so there's no there's it. no perfect solution because yeah. sometimes the opposite happens. The clients come back and they've lost their documents. You know, or they or a client has passed away and nobody can find their documents. Mm -hmm. So you don't really know why they can't be found, whether they were lost or somebody just didn't like them. But, yeah. but the point is, um, it, it's, there's no perfect solution, but yeah. I prefer to let the clients have yeah. their documents. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. The safe deposit box is the best place to keep it. Um, okay, so we have a little less than five minutes left. Uh, maybe because for wind up and so forth, you know. But uh, are there some reasons that people should think about actually revisiting their estate plans, maybe some recent developments? Well, I tell my clients, they ask me how long is an estate plan good for, and it really depends on what happens in a person's life, for one thing. Um, certainly, change in circumstance is always a reason to review your estate plan, whether it's the person you were talking about being your executor or trustee, or whether it's something that happened in your family. Those kinds of things are significant. Um, Okay, so I'm, I'm going to help you out a little yeah, bit because I'm the tax person. So, uh, so one is uh, you know the increased exemption. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I mean that has a I think an impact on a lot. Actually, it's mainstream. Yeah, many um, people, um, many people previously did estate planning. This isn't so much with wills, but with trust in order to do tax planning. Yes. And that's when credits. When I first started practicing law 35 years ago, the credit was sixty thousand dollars. That's how much money you could yeah. leave. It wasn't even a credit; it was an exemption. Yeah, it was an exemption. That's yeah, <laughs> sixty thousand dollars. Yeah. It was it was more money then, but it wasn't even then a lot of money. Yeah. Now we're up to over five point three million dollars mm -hmm. per individual. Yeah. And what that means is um, each individual. So if you're married, that's the husband and the wife have that exemption. So they have as a couple more than ten million dollars. Mm -hmm. So a lot of estate planning that was done uh, back in the day when the credits were much lower uh, is not really necessary at, for tax planning purposes anymore. So people can simplify their estate planning unless there are other reasons like the children from the prior marriage discussion we had earlier, why you want to have these two trusts, one irrevocable and one revocable after the first death. Uh, but for tax planning purposes, a lot of that has gone away. And so um, there still are issues that need to be dealt with when a person dies. Um, and one of them is called uh, portability, mm -hmm. which is um, where 
a surviving spouse can elect to carry, instead of taking one credit at the first death and then another at the second, can elect to carry both the credits forward to the second death mm -hmm. and then, um, in effect, have a $10 million plus dollar mm -hmm. credit at the second death. But in order to do that, you have to elect it. Mm -hmm. So there's a requirement that you file uh, a 706 return, even if the estate isn't large enough to require one, right. and choose portability as an option. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that allows you to take both credits at the second death with a lot of qualifications. If you remarry, it changes. There's all kinds of, it's, it's not uncomplicated, but right. the law has changed significantly. Right. So, yeah, so the estate uh, picture has changed for the tax part, and so what it means though is that there should be even more emphasis now on what are the family's needs. It's always been the case there that that should be primary, but, uh, but a lot of people had their eye very heavily on that estate uh, tax picture. Right, right. And, and also then what's happened is, is that we had a shift in, con in our focus from the estate tax itself, because it doesn't apply to very many people anymore, to more of the income tax considerations right. and how we can get some tax benefits there. Right. One of, one of the big issues is that um, w there's a capital gains issue, which is, mm -hmm. you know, when a person dies, there's a, what's called a stepped up basis. That's a little bit beyond our conversation. But you have to be careful about that also because how you decide these things determines whether you're not, when you get a stepped up basis and how much you get. So you, you need to be careful about that also. Okay. okay, Bill. Well, I think we're getting close to being out of time. So uh, mostly I want to thank you right now for joining me and uh, sharing this information. This is a, a really a very important topic, I feel, and especially for people with minor children, right. uh, that they really do need to provide for them, and, it, and they're so busy chasing them, <laughs> trying to keep them alive, uh, that, uh, that it's, it's not foremost in their mind, but they really should. Okay, well, folks, uh, that's all for today. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you next time on Financial Insider Weekly.